everybody, good afternoon or good morning, wherever you are, uh, and welcome to our seminar today. This is the International Space Science Institute in Bern, Switzerland, and I am Tilman Schwon, and I'm your host today. Some of you may have already or may already know our seminar series that we started almost a year ago, uh, and we were first looking at missions that we believed changed the game in the space sciences. And this series ended in March this year, uh, but then we at ISI decided that we wanted to continue the, the seminar series because it was uh, quite successful, but we wanted to change gears a bit. And we now restarted the seminar with uh, this talk today, and then the quarter will extend until the end of July. So instead of looking at missions, we solicited talks by international leading scientists on ideas and findings about the solar system, the universe, and our terrestrial environment. And we believe we have a nice lineup. You can look at our website and all the talks are listed there, ranging from climate science as today to, the so to solar system science to astrophysics. From the Earth's climate to the formation of the solar system, to the composition of the sun, to black holes, and back to the effects, and that will be the last to talk in this series, on uh, the pandemic on CO2 emissions. We will meet every Thursday at this hour, and every talk will be recorded and linked on, on our website, so you can visit it later and check it out again. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Jonathan Donges from the Potsdam Institute of Climate Impact Research. Uh, he's also affiliated with uh, Stockholm and Princeton uh, universities, and his main research topic is on Earth resilience in the Anthropocene, which is, I understand, also the title of his ERC research project. And he will talk about a very interesting, at least to, to me, and I believe that for every one of you, uh, phenomenon or problem as tipping points in the Earth climate. So points that we reach where maybe there is no way back, you know, if we cross them. So he will speak to us, and this uh, uh, topic is cascading interactions between tipping elements in the Anthropocene, Earth system, risks and opportunities. And Jonathan, Jonathan, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you, Tilman, for, for the kind introduction. Let me let me share my screen. Yes. This works. Okay, so um, I will I will speak on um, Tilman also mentioned that already mentioned the title. So it's it's about nonlinear dynamics um, in the Earth system, both in the climate system and social systems, and how um, how both interact and what one can do to to learn more about that. So it's um, I'm going to begin with um, talking about the risks of nonlinear tipping dynamics in the climate system. Um, some work that we've done in that field in the past uh, couple of years. Then move on to uh, from from the risks in the natural systems to the potentials for positive social tipping points that have been discussed for um, quite a bit. Um, in, uh, in in the uh, in the literature in in the past years, um, and then uh, to, to so these are solution oriented tipping points now, and then finally uh, move on to outlining a synthesis of um, whole Earth system analysis for understanding these human climate system tipping interactions, which may actually be crucial for uh, determining the future pathways that our Earth system is evolving on. Now. Let me start with um, the, this, this nice picture of a part of Telegrafenberg, the Telegraph Hill in Potsdam, where um, the Potsdam Institute is located in the uh, science campus Albert Einstein. Um, the building that you see on the upper right is the, the main building of PIC, the Michelson House, which is the former, um, former uh, Royal Prussian uh, Astrophysics Institute, which is actually um, at, at least in Potsdam, it's said to be the first astrophysics institute of the world, where, um, for example, the inter interstellar medium was discovered with some of the biggest telescopes of that time. One of them is the big refractor, which you see on the upper left-hand side. So this is a very uh, space science-related place that I'm working at, and it also has other uh, another um, interesting uh, link to 
uh, to, to what I'm going to talk about now. So it is deeply shaped by past climate history. Uh, the telegraph hill is actually a glacial terminal moraine of the past um, glacial maximum, the glass glaciation that ended um, 20, 000, that had this maximum 20,000 years ago and ended um, only uh, about 10,000 years ago. And this place shaped by the ice ages kind of takes us into um, the paleoclimate perspective on global warming that I want to um, start my uh, reflections on the climate system tipping points with. This is a graph. It's, it's a bit like an extended uh, so-called climate change hockey stick. It, it shows the a mean um, global uh, mean surface temperature evolution um, from uh, during the past 20,000 years. Um, and it shows that in the last glacial maximum um, 20,000 years ago, temperatures were about three degrees colder um, than uh, during, the, um, during the Holocene, during the pre-industrial area era that uh, before the uh, start of the industrial revolution, that's always the reference period for global warming. Um, temperatures have then risen uh, relatively slow. Um, uh, if you look at that picture, actually for geological standards, this is really very already a very fast uh, dynamics. The nonlinear the non dynamics of uh, deglaciation is much faster than the glaciation that leads uh, the Earth system into an ice age. This is much slower. The, uh, the deglaciation, is, uh, deglaciation is much faster, but here um, it looks relatively slow. We see then that during the Holocene, the past 10,000 years, the climate system has been really, really stable. This is the time when human societies, complex human societies, um, nation states, um, agriculture, etc., developed. And um, only um, at the end, after a phase of very slow cooling, that would have eventually taken the system back to an ice age, uh, there's this sharp increase in temperatures. Um, this is, um, and if you if you look into future scenarios, now here computed uh, continued um, IPCC future emission scenarios until the year 2500, you find that there's a there's a super sharp increase, a super sharp hockey stick here, and um, with temperatures rising up to uh, eight degrees um, above pre-industrial for uh, very strong emission scenarios for more likely emission scenarios like the RCP 4.5 or RCP 6.0, warming is um, still very severe. It's not only larger in magnitude than the natural warming since the last deglaciation, but it's also about um, up to 100 times faster. So both the amplitude and the rate of this warming are unprecedented um, in, in the recent geological past. And this is kind of what poses us big challenges um, of climate change, both in terms of um, impacts on societies, impacts on ecosystems, um, etc. Now, there's not only the the gradual impacts of increasing temperatures and and the other phenomena of of uh, extreme events and uh, and uh, impacts on agriculture, forests, etc. Et but there's also more nonlinear responses, and they have been called tipping elements in the Earth system. Um, they are subsystems. In different parts of um, of the Earth's climate, um, that that can respond nonlinearly to um, to temperature changes. So they they have thresholds that um, that are critical thresholds that, when transgressed, can lead to changes in these systems that are um, in many cases not easily reversible and that are quite can be quite abrupt and um, lead to quite large changes, even if only small um, temperature increases across these thresholds are. Um, are happening and now let me go a little bit i'll go a little bit more into details on this now in the next couple of slides but um just keep keep this picture in mind some of the important examples are the ice sheets the big ice sheets the ocean circulation amazon rainforest boreal forests uh, monsoon systems and nino etc and there is not only individual tipping elements but there's also risks of uh, global warming anthropogenic influences triggering cascades of um, tipping points that um, could lead to, um, could amplify global warming even and, and lead to um, amplified impacts that, um, that are due to domino-like interactions between these tipping elements. This is also something that I'll look into um, in the next couple of slides in more detail. The, um, because there are these nonlinear interactions, um, the Anthropocene, where human societies are really shaping, deeply shaping the Earth system now, um, um, 
it's important to, to take an integrated perspective at the whole Earth system. And this is something that I'll also go into in the third part of the talk, but this is um, just to show that it's not only the interacting natural climate system tipping um, elements that we're looking at, but also their interaction with potential positive social or also negative social tipping elements. Um, this all um, can lead to um, different trajectories of the Earth system and the Anthropocene, different future trajectories as has been uh, um, um, put out in this perspectives piece here led by Will Stefan, um, where really the challenge is um, it's, it's quite, it's, it's, it's a bit of a cartoonish figure, but it really illustrates that um, there, there is now, we are at a, at a crossroads at the moment um, where Earth system stewardship towards a more stabilized Earth system is, is still possible. Um, but there is a large risk that continued emissions and the failure to limit global warming, to limit uh, biosphere um, destruction, biosphere degradation could really um, lead um, to a hothouse earth pathway as, as it has been called, where um, um, stability of, of the current earth system state is really um, put under large pressure, which it already is, but um, <clears throat> this could, these impacts would be much, much stronger than what we are experiencing uh, today. And maybe uh, just to mention a very recent example, the ruling of the German federal court um, on, on uh, the German climate policy being illegal because it's ne it neglects the rights of future generations. This is something that could actually help to push um, the system towards a, towards a state of more earth system stewardship which might in the end lead to a stabilized earth. And these are all topics which I get more into when I talk about social tipping points in the second part of the talk. Now, focusing in a bit on the climate system. This is, um, again, the different types of climate tipping elements um, um, that, that I'll, I'll talk about now here. These are the ice and cryosphere tipping elements, um, the atmospheric and oceanic circulation systems, um, and the ecosystems and biosphere. And these are all uh, tipping elements that we are studying at PIC in, in uh, Research Department 1, where my working group and the Future Lab together with Ricarda Winkelmann are located. And um, Ricarda is mainly focusing on the cryosphere, um, for example. Others are working on the other systems. And in the Future Lab, we try to integrate really uh, and look at the interactions between these different tipping elements. Now, let's look a bit into more detail of what, how these critical thresholds and tipping points in climate um, dynamics actually look like. The, um, for different systems, um, typically um, critical parameters can be identified where um, that have these critical thresholds. For example, for the Atlantic um, meridional overturning circulation, there exist um, feedback mechanisms nonlinear dynamics, namely here the salt, so-called salt advection feedback that can lead to uh, a tipping to a qualitative change in the uh, North Atlantic circulation um, if the freshwater influx into the North Atlantic becomes too large. So we can see here when the freshwater forcing increases, the strength of the um, North Atlantic deep water flow um, decreases. And then when it hits the so-called stomach defoliation, uh, it can actually collapse to a state which is, um, which is uh, so-called off-state, so where the circulation is really uh, much weaker or even inversing its direction. And this has large consequences for uh, heat and soil transport in the Atlantic Ocean uh, with actually important consequences for climate in Europe and North America, for example, because not only because um, less heat would be transported to Europe from the tropics, but also because weather systems, uh, the generation of weather systems in the North Atlantic, which is very important for our weather in Europe, could change uh, completely. So there could be a completely different weather regime that we are experiencing if this tipping happens. And um, this is only a graph from a very simple model, but there are also much more complex models that show this behavior. And um, a second example is uh, the Amazon rainforest, um, or more generally a tropical forest ecosystem, where it has been shown that um, these um, tropical forests can also, um, under certain climate conditions, uh, have multi-stability and critical thresholds and tipping points. And um, in this case, the critical parameter is typically um, rainfall, um, uh, where a large, uh, um, too low amount of rainfall can also push 
a system like the Amazon rainforest to a, to a state which is more resembling a savanna than an actual rainforest. This is another example um, of how this looks. But actually, many of the tipping elements in the climate system can be represented by these um, so-called double fold um, or cusp bifurcations that um, um, are as, as they are shown here. And if the tipping element, um, if the thresholds of the tipping elements are mapped to, um, to the level of uh, global mean temperature anomaly that they correspond to, we can actually uh, plot this risk map here where we show um, on top of this temperature evolution graph that I had in the beginning, we can show where the critical ranges, um, uh, where the risk of switching tipping elements uh, becomes, very, becomes large um, lie. And we can see that um, there is already um, quite a number of tipping elements like the Western Arctic ice sheet, the Greenland ice sheet, summer sea ice in the Arctic, Alpine glaciers and coral reefs, where um, the um, tipping points um, could already lie at temperatures where um, that are already reached today. So about at about one degree of global warming. The risk is then still relatively low, but the uncertainty in where these thresholds lie is also very, is also quite large. So there is quite a risk that with increasing temperatures, particularly when moving into even into the target range of the Paris Agreement, 1.5 to 2 degree target, that the tipping of some of these elements becomes quite likely. And um, for larger temperatures, like a global warming of four degrees, which could be reached by the end of the century if climate policy is not um, strict enough, uh, the Amazon rainforest, boreal forests, and the AMOC and other systems can also become uh, at risk of tipping. Other tipping elements like the Eastern Arctic ice sheet permafrost or Arctic winter sea ice are, um, are at risk at even larger temperatures. But one should say again uh, that these estimates are, are, um, are still, there's quite large uncertainties here, um, but they are continuously updated and improved these estimates um, at the moment. And um, there's also large uh, model intercomparison projects, for example, planned now to constrain further the risks and uncertainties in, in these types of um, estimates. Now, uh, let me focus a bit on, on the Antarctic ice sheet as an important tipping element because it has a very large impact uh, on sea level rise, on global sea level rise. There's a potential, a sea level rise potential in Antarctica of um, up to over 50 meters. Of course, this would manifest in a very long time. It, it takes thousands of years to melt the Antarctic ice sheet. But it's still something that um, it's a commitment that could be triggered today um, that that would be uh, something to deal with for many, many future generations. So it's something to look at. And in our group, we looked at this using the uh, detailed process based um, simulation model, uh, dynamic ice sheet model PISM, which is actually a very large uh, system of partial differential equations that describes the flow of the ice the thermodynamics of the ice and also its interaction with the ocean and the atmosphere. And now what we do here is a hysteresis experiment where we increase very slowly increase global mean temperature, which is then translated to regional temperature around Antarctica. And then um, this, the response of the ice sheet is simulated. And there's actually um, a video now. Let me see if this works. Yes. So now you can see um, how the temperature changes. We are now at about uh, 1.5 degrees. Now, two degrees of global warming, you can see that there's now a large pulse of melting in the West Antarctic part of the ice sheet, where now um, about which already triggers about two degrees, uh, two meters of sea level rise. Um, this could be reached by the end of the century, even in the Paris Agreement. Now we are moving to five degrees of global warming. Um, now, six degrees, one can see the continuous melting in the map. Uh, now, also, East Antarctica starts to melt, and there's a large pulse of melting now between seven and eight degrees. Uh, of warming in East Antarctica, another tipping point where a large part of the East Antarctic ice sheet starts to uh, vanish. Now there's already um, 40 meters of sea level rise or so, and now the Antarctic ice sheet is actually disappearing nearly with 10 degrees and more of global warming, and only glaciers in the very, very high mountain ranges of Antarctica are remaining now. Uh, the other parts of Antarctica are uh, a lot, large parts of West Antarctica will actually become marine basins, so they're actually. Uh, um, on the ocean floor. The ice is there grounded on the ocean floor. Other parts of Antarctica will become ice-free. So this is um, just to 
illustrate how such a tipping behavior looks. Here for Antarctica, again, we found two major, this is also shown here in this hysteresis figure, we identified these two major thresholds, uh, one around two degrees of global warming where um, the Western Arctic ice sheet is, is lost very likely, and then another one between seven and eight degrees of global warming where there's a large gradient in the melting of the Eastern Arctic ice sheet. And um, one can see when we reverse the temperature uh, change um, in the same way as we uh, increase it, we can see strong hysteresis behavior actually. So the uh, Antarctic ice sheet um, recovers on a different path um, uh, than uh, the path that it took to melt. And it's actually, um, you can see that uh, it takes much longer, it takes a much stronger cooling to recover the same amount of ice uh, compared to the melting path. And actually to recover the current state of the ice sheet, uh, a cooling of up to three degrees below current, uh, com today's temperatures are needed. So it's actually, um, you need temperatures comparable to, um, to a glacial maximum, three degrees before um, below pre-industrial temperatures to recover the Antarctic ice sheet. So this shows that in some sense, the Antarctic ice sheet is actually a legacy uh, of, of the ice ages, which we are about to, to put uh, at, at stake at the moment. The, there's also climate feedbacks induced by cryospheric tipping elements. So it's not only that the Antarctic ice sheet melting, for example, uh, or the Greenland ice sheet melting needs to, um, to sea level rise um, and, uh, and maybe changes in the ocean circulation, but it also can directly lead to, uh, to warming via um, the radiative budget of the Earth. And this is basically the albedo feedback, uh, but also the lapse rate feedback and uh, also cloud and water vapor feedbacks that play a role here. And the, those are the ones that we studied in, in this paper here. Uh, with um, an intermediate complexity Earth system model called CLAMBA uh, 3 alpha. And uh, we found that there is an additional global warming due to the loss of cryosphere elements. Um, this regionally, this can be seen uh, that this is of course quite localized in the polar regions where um, the ice sheets are mainly uh, of course located. The mountain glaciers were also included, but they, are, they have a smaller effect because they are uh, comparably much smaller. One can see that the regional effects here, particularly over, of course, the Greenland ice sheet and the Western Arctic ice sheet can be exceeding two degrees. This is kind of, this is amplifying uh, even further the polar, so-called polar amplification of climate change, which we already see today. Um, and if you average this overall, um, one finds that um, there is um, an additional global warming commitment to ice loss um, summed up, um, it, it is uh, up to 0 0.4 degrees more um, than, uh, uh, than the pure effects of uh, the greenhouse gas warming and, and other climate feedback. So it's quite an effect to consider and um, uh, to consider when, when talking about uh, global warming targets, for example, of 1.5 to 2 degrees as the Paris Agreement is, is aiming at. So this is, um, this was showing um, global um, feedbacks of, of tipping dynamics on, on the climate state. Now, um, there's also um, um, much more detailed work that we did on, on the tipping cascades and potential domino effects that I mentioned in the introduction. Now, the, there are at, at the moment um, quite some challenges in, in modeling Earth system tipping elements and their interactions, one should say. It is important to mention that tipping processes may not be fully represented in uh, state-of-the-art Earth system models. So there's the large models that are used for the IPCC um, uh, um, reports um, for the CMIP uh, model intercomparison, the climate model intercomparison project. Some of these tipping elements are not represented at the moment. There are considerable uncertainties also in the parameters of tipping elements in their critical thresholds and the timescales that, uh, that they evolve upon uh, and their interactions. So the strengths and the sign of interaction even, et cetera. And um, complex Earth system models are often still too slow, too complex for large scale ensemble simulations that are needed for risk analysis under uncertainty. But um, we know from many, um, we know from many uh, um, individual, so smaller, more specialized modeling studies, we know from paleoclimate data and also from observations that many of these systems are very likely to show tipping behavior. So it's only that the large complex models are not yet well equipped 
or they are not far developed enough at the moment to represent these complex processes. And because there is this challenge, we are putting forward a, uh, a network approach, an emulator approach to modeling um, these um, nonlinear interactions. And we, um, this, which enables us to study the network resilience to this cascading dynamics. This is a, a general approach, which can also be applied to, for example, technical infrastructure systems. Um, we have applied it also to the uh, to moisture recycling in the Amazon rainforest, um, and um, it, it's based on uh, on a, on nonlinear differential equations interacting on a network structure where um, we investigate under which conditions the tipping of one element uh, can lead to a cascade that triggers the tipping of other elements. This is basically what we do, and um, we apply this now to a risk analysis of emerging climate tipping cascades. Um, in this system of four tipping elements, um, of four very relevant tipping elements, the Greenland ice sheet, um, the um, West Antarctic ice sheet, the AMOC, so again, the Atlantic Mid Meridional Overturning Circulation, and the Amazon rainforest. We also consider their interactions, um, the processes that are um, quite well constrained, well known in the literature, and also from expert elicitation. So for example, interactions of the ice sheets via sea level rise, um, the um, also interaction of the ice sheets via um, ocean circulation, um, the interaction of AMOC and Greenland ice sheet, for example, via um, increased freshwater floods from the Greenland ice sheet and also by reduction of warming, by weakening of the AMOC, et cetera. So there are quite a number of processes which are um, relatively well constrained that we could include here. Um, for some of them, however, the, the sign of the interaction is not, not yet uh, completely clear. So we, we basically computed different variants, um, the plausible variants, the positive and the negative interaction, like the change of precipitation induced by weakening AMOC that then affects the Amazon rainforest. We propagate uncertainties. So basically parameter uncertainties in the uh, threshold locations, but also in, um, in the interaction strengths and the sign of interaction, et cetera, via a large scale Monte Carlo ensemble um, up, uh, using <clears throat> up to 10 million simulations in this ensemble. Um, and um, we use then the network approach that I mentioned before to actually identify the roles of tipping elements and cascades in this model. And there we find, and this is what these domino, uh, dominoes show uh, that are shown in the figure. Um, we show that the ice sheets actually often act as initiators of cascades. So in many cases, for example, 65% um, of the cascades that occur, the Greenland ice sheet is the initial trigger. Um, and this is because it has quite a low uh, initial um, uh, threshold temperature in, uh, in the ensemble, and it also has quite central location in the network. Um, and uh, uh, we also find that the AMOC, the uh, ocean circulation, is a predominantly a tr transmitter of cascades, so it occurs in um, in 28% uh, of all cascades, but it initiates only, um, only a low percentage. And this is because of its central location in the network in, uh, in a more topological sense. Now, beyond looking at the roles of these tipping elements, which is of course also of interest for, for impacts on, on societies, um, we, we also looked um, at uh, the implications for earth system resilience, the larger implications of these tipping cascades. And we did this in the sense of um, first looking at um, how the effective uh, uh, temperature thresholds when, uh, of when the tipping elements are actually at risk changes due to the interactions. And there we find, this is the upper, uh, upper panels, the upper row of panels, the interactions really tend to destabilize the system overall. Only the Greenland ice sheet is um, stabilized, but with large uncertainties when interaction strength increases. This is one unknown parameter that we have uh, in the model, we don't know um, how, um, how, how strongly these tipping elements actually interact, how strong the effects of these interactions overall are compared to the individual dynamics of the tipping elements. So we use this as a free parameter. But we can see overall the interaction is destabilizing, the effective critical temperature decreases for all tipping elements except of Greenland. And in the lower panel, we show that um, there is actually a risk for triggering tipping cascades that increases quite severely between two to three degrees of global warming above pre industrial conditions. This is separ uh, separating the stabilized earth state from a hothouse pathway uh, state, as you could call it, um, in, in our model world here. 
Um, and the uh, uncertainty is actually largest, the uncertainty about re these results is largest in the policy, very policy relevant warming range between one and three degrees of global warming. So it's actually, um, these results imply that it's very important to, um, to, uh, to further um, improve these results, to further reduce the uncertainties, but also to be very cautious already now to say, okay, there is a large risk increase um, already in the range of the Paris Agreement's targets. And um, the uncertainty is already uh, quite large um, even before that. So it's, we are already on thin ice in, in that sense. Now, I would like to move on from the natural system tipping elements that we have studied uh, in the past years in our group to um, social tipping points for decarbonization. So uh, go, moving a bit from um, empirical evidence that we've collected to modeling. So this is the positive side of, um, of tipping points that I would like to talk about. So what is the motivation for this? The, it has been shown that a very unprecedented rate of socioeconomic change and decarbonization, so fossil fuel phase out is needed to meet the Paris Climate Agreement and to, to reduce the risk of, for example, triggering tipping cascades in the climate system and other um, dangerous impacts of global warming. One uh, way that this, this has been proposed is the so-called carbon law. It's a, it's a simple rule that says that emissions, global emissions would have to be halved every decade until 2050, a net zero um, uh, emissions uh, state is reached. And this means, uh, of course, an exponential decay in, in emissions that is needed. So, but how can these, how can such very large rates of um, socioeconomic change be achieved? This is a, an unprecedented challenge. In the past uh, decades, the past hundreds of years, emissions have always been rising. So how to reverse this? The whole number of, um, of groups have now started to study um, positive tipping points, the potential of so-called sensitive interventions for decarbonization uh, or tipping positive change. Um, and um, the, there is overall an increased interest in social ecological tipping dynamics. So not only um, in the ecological and climate systems, but also in social systems, um, as we've shown in this review paper here. And um, I would now like to go in a little bit more detail into, into this study here that, that we've done. It's a large scale expert elicitation where we've, um, we've been uh, looking into the potentials really for into the different uh, potential social tipping elements that have the potential to lead to such large rates, uh, rates of emission reduction. Again, as I've said before, this is just a way of looking at the required rates of emission reduction. The, um, these rates would be much, uh, much larger than, uh, than what has been uh, historically experienced, for example, in World War II or the collapse of communism, but also during the COVID-19 pandemic. So during the COVID-19 pandemic, 2020 has, ha has seen um, uh, uh, up to 8%, I think, decrease of emissions compared to the year before. And this has been completely unprecedented. For decades before, there has always been a, a growth of emissions by by uh, one to two percent per year, and now uh, on on an ambitious uh, climate mitigation pathway like the pink one, the lowest one, um, the reduction annual reduction rates would have to go up uh, to um, twenty percent uh, in um, in the mid of of the, this century. So uh, much uh, larger rates than what has been caused by the COVID nineteen pandemic. Just to put this into context, and yes, there is empirical evidence for social tipping dynamics. Uh, not only uh, from our expert incitation, but also from past societal transformations, revolutions, collapse, etc. And this is something that we've also um, uh, we are reflecting on together with social scientists in, um, in 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 our Dominos project, where this work has been done. Now we ask these experts, um, what are the social tipping elements that could initiate such a socially and economically disruptive transformation? leading to a complete decarbonization by 2050 to the net zero, uh, at least. And um, the tipping elements that were um, identified, uh, they live on, on different levels of social structure, so to say. So they, some of them, like the financial markets and the information feedbacks, live on systems like market exchanges, resource allocation, etc., which are quite fast systems. So they, are, um, they live on timescales of faster than a year. There's also uh, systems like human settlements, 
and energy production storage systems, which are on the in the realm more of technology and governance, which are uh, slower to change, more on a decadal time scale, uh, maybe annual time scale. This is about uh, carbon neutral cities, uh, fossil free energy production, distributed energy, etc. But there are also social fitting elements, which are more really in the deeper. Uh, social fabric, so to say, so on policy and regulations, infrastructure, but also really informal institutions, customs, norms, and religion. So the education system, tipping element, and the norms and value system, tipping element, are also quite relevant. And the idea is really that uh, uh, the, the finding was that while these faster uh, social tipping elements would be needed to trigger a change and uh, drive innovation, um, also these higher level tipping elements on the social norms and values and the education are, are also needed in the background to stabilize a new societal state that really um, values uh, earth system stewardship um, for, for a positive future of humanity. And uh, this is, um, there are also social tipping interventions that have been identified in these different clusters, for example, climate education, for example, removing fossil fuel subsidies, for example, greenhouse gas information disclosure or divestment, but I'm, I won't go into more detail on this. It's just that it, this is a very interesting complex system that is, of course, also interacting with the natural uh, climate system and the, the tipping elements there that we are now uh, studying further, also using met methods from modeling and uh, a lot of data analysis. And this is what um, I'm also going to show in, uh, in the next couple of slides. So we've been looking at one example of such a potential uh, social tipping point that has been uh, e evolving, emerging during the past years. This is the Fridays for Future movement. And this is at least for, for Germany, one can see the uh, really strong impact of, of this movement um, on the uh, attitudes of German voters. So uh, in, if you look at the question of, uh, is the environment, do you think the environment is an important problem? Uh, this, these numbers have increased from fluctuating for decades on, uh, around uh, about 10% or even below that. They've, they've risen up to 60% in end of 2019, and then they have decreased a bit again due to COVID, but they, they are still much, much higher than they were um, before. And this has even manifested in, uh, in, in the percentage of people that would vote for the Green Party uh, in Germany, interestingly. So it's not only uh, that you think it's a problem, but you would actually act on it. And um, this is uh, one, one empirical data source. Uh, um, so this is large scale social survey data um, that one can use for these purposes. There's also other types of, of data on social tipping elements. There's, um, um, for example, evidence from empirical, uh, from, from social, um, sorry, from behavioral experiments. This is what I was going to say, social science behavioral experiments that show evidence for social tipping. Um, and there's also longstanding uh, uh, research, of course, in sociology and political science, et cetera, on these um, dynamics. But of course, also quite some critical reflection in these disciplines. So this um, remains a very active, very, um, but also controversial area of research, um, to, to be fair. Um, the, what, what we've been doing also is to work out the key differences between um, social and climate tipping dynamics, because this is important for us if we want to create analytical tools to understand uh, these systems more and to also finally advise society and policy about, about these dynamics. And um, one important dimension of differences of these complex systems is, is agency. So I'll, I'll be relatively short on these slides, but to say that in social tipping elements and social systems, of course, there's agency there, there's the ability um, of, of um, actors to intentionally um, uh, make changes to the system um, and deliberately create changes. And this is, of course, something that is not present uh, in the climate system, in the physical systems, and also not as much, at least, in the ecological systems. Um, there's also social structure and networks, which uh, is distinguishing uh, social systems from, from ecological and uh, climate systems. There's much more complex social structure, much more dynamic, uh, networks than in ecology, and certainly there's not not too many uh, relevant social networks in the physical climate system. There's also um, key differences between scales. The uh, climate tipping elements tend to live on much larger spatial and temporal scales, while the social tipping points comparably on on um, faster time scales and also smaller spatial scales. 
but there is quite some overlap, which might also be important when we're looking at the interactions later. And finally, there's definitely a different level of complexity. While, of course, climate systems are also complex in the sense of they, they, um, they, there's many laws interacting and uh, there's a high, uh, there's a large spatial resolution required to model these systems, etc. There's still relatively, uh, relatively um, um, handleable number of, of basic laws that govern the fluid dynamics, that govern the thermodynamics, the radiative balance, etc. Um, in contrast, the social tipping processes are, occur in complex adaptive systems um, where greater complexity can manifest in the drivers and the mechanisms and the resulting pathways of, of these processes. And there's also a large, much larger diversity of actors and elements of different outcomes that can be generated also by feedbacks, by anticipation and by internal mental models and also scientific models that these actors have at hand um, so that the development pathways of these systems are much less predictable if they are predictable at all. And it, also, it is often even unclear what the final state, the state of a system will be for social systems. Um, so, um, so what the changes resulting from a tipping process will be, uh, whether they be normatively considered positive or negative may even be contested because different actors have different opinions or feelings about that. So all these complexities are of course additive. But overall, we, we came to the conclusion that a network perspective, a complex network perspective on social tipping dynamics is, is very valuable, very fruitful. And um, this leads us also to a definition of how we can treat these systems. Um, and um, the important uh, point I think is that here we, we, we don't talk anymore so much about a critical thresholds, but more about critical conditions. So a social system, we call the social tipping element if under certain critical conditions, a small change in the system or its environment, so the perturbation, but it has to be a small one, can lead to a qualitative macroscopic large change in the system. And typically this can manifest by network effects like spreading dynamics, contagion dynamics like in the COVID epidemic, but also in changes in the network structure like polarization, uh, heterogenization, marginalization. So there's different network effects that one can study there and use the full toolbox of complex network theory that has been developed in, in statistical physics and other disciplines uh, to that end. Uh, we've been applying this to our modeling of these systems. And um, I'll finish this section with two um, small examples of this type of modeling, which we call, which is called adaptive co-evolutionary network modeling. This is models, dynamic um, models where the local dynamics of nodes of agents uh, then changes can change the network structure, which in turn then can affect the local dynamics. So we have interesting um, and important uh, state uh, topology feedbacks in these models, as they of course also occur in the real world. Um, and in one study that was published last year by our postdoc Mark Wiedermann, we uh, we worked on a network-based micro foundation of social tipping. So we we based um, uh, a network spreading model uh, based on the in, on a famous paper by Duncan Watts um, from from Network Science in um, and uh, we were building on this and we find the model and um, we were then able to use this model as a micro foundation of the macroscopic uh, and and very um, uh, in the social sciences very um, established Granovetta threshold model for uh, for the emergence of um, of uh, collective action. And um, we were able to show social tipping in the numbers of, of instigators of um, certainly active um, people in a, in a social movement and potential supporters, as is shown on the right hand side. So again, we see these classical uh, double saddle node bifurcations or cusp uh, bifurcations. And um, we could even reduce this to a one dimensional uh, system using um, moment closure techniques for systematic bifurcation analysis. And so this is nice because it shows how um, small scale microscopic network spreading processes um, in a social system can lead to the emergence of macroscopic collective action uh, with a clear bifurcation structure. And um, we now, in the next step, we use this model uh, to study an interaction of such a, um, of, um, of such a social tipping element with um, climate dynamics. And in this model, we um, study how um, we study 
uh, we study this by combining this, this uh, model of uh, the emergence of collective action for climate change, basically a model of, um, of, of the emergence of, of that people are aware of climate change and are willing to act upon it. Um, we combine this model with sea level rise projections, uh, very detailed population elevation distributions across the world and cross-national climate change concern data. So this is now um, a risk analysis or a potential analysis of social tipping based on a very large set of empirical data sets, both on sea level rise, geography, and, uh, and social science uh, properties. And uh, what we find is that the concern about climate change that uh, has been measured in different countries actually increases the tipping potential. This is, of course, not super surprising, but it is nice to show this robustly um, in this type of framework. Um, the anticipation of climate change, so the, that um, how, how long into the future people uh, consider sea level rise in their own, um, in their own region, um, actually can be shown to move the system closer to a social tipping point. And um, this is, um, as is shown in the, in, the, in the middle panels here. And um, importantly, also um, emerges again the notion that interventions are important to kick the system into a tip state. It's not a single control parameter that, uh, that is relevant, but the tipping arises from multiple factors like concern about climate change, but also the anticipation timescale of a society. So this is more related to, um, to, um, to for example, how long a government um, is, um, is forced by, by the national court, by the constitutional court to, uh, to consider climate policy for the future. And um, so these are parameters that can actually be calibrated also to current uh, societal developments, which is quite interesting. So overall, the so-called noise-induced tipping is more prominent here than uh, the so-called parameter-induced tipping. And um, we find again that there are some regions that, that have quite some potential for this type of emergence of uh, collective climate action. For example, regions, uh, countries around the Indian Ocean, like India, uh, and also some East African countries and also Southeast Asian countries, um, but uh, countries more um, um, around the Atlantic and uh, the Eastern Pacific are less, um, um, show less potential to, to this particular mechanism. So wrap up on, on the social tipping point is that the social dynamics is a form of uh, social change that would be a key um, for triggering rapid decarbonization and sustainability transformations. This dynamics could be involved in relevant human earth system interactions and feedbacks that are really uh, can be decisive for future pathways in the Anthropocene. This is something that we're currently researching into very much with new projects, new, um, new work. And um, first steps uh, we've done in collecting empirical evidence and modeling, but of course, much more work remains to be done. And uh, now to, I, I'd like to spend the past, uh, the last couple of minutes on, on the integral perspective concluding I hope you can bear with me on this. Uh, so uh, it's the agenda about closing the loop in whole earth system analysis, which really drives my, my, uh, my own research. And um, it's, it's really about moving from the uh, traditional Bretton perspective on the earth system that has dominated uh, earth system modeling climate uh, science for the past uh, three decades, say three to four decades where the interactions of the physical climate system and the biogeochemical cycles and ecosystems are mainly considered, but human activities are only treated as a driver uh, and only a very small part of the system. Um, we really have to move to an Anthropocene perspective of this, um, as is shown in this updated Bresenton diagram by Will Steffen and, and co-workers, where the anthroposphere, so the sphere of human societies, is really represented in an equal uh, a symmetric, more symmetric way compared to the natural systems to do to really do justice to uh, to um, to the realization that uh, that we live now in the Anthropocene, an age dominated by by uh, by the dynamics occurring in human societies and in the interactions between the Earth system and human societies. And this is then the agenda of what whole Earth system analysis is about. In my own research, combining complex systems analysis and human Earth system interactions to be able to map out um, the different uh, um, parts of, of earth system parameter space, so to, uh, so to speak, as uh, plotted out here in this, in this graph, inspired by John Chernhuber's famous papers from uh, 1999, 1998, where um, 
and, and also not only mapping out where catastrophic and dangerous domains are, where safe and just operating spaces are, but also how the transition pathways between these different uh, regions look, could look like. <clears throat> and um, this work, of course, requires modeling, requires uh, computational models and a lot of data, um, but these models really need to include human agency, um, networks, transformative uh, capabilities, but also uh, co-evolution between natural and societal parts of the earth system and this is something that current models are cannot really do or are only doing to a very little degree we have developed a, a new system called copan core um, a new modeling system where we can start to build such models and to really study the effects of human uh, earth system interactions tipping point interactions on future pathways um, of the earth system in the anthropocene to really understand how this um how to make sense of, of such a graph here which is from johan rockstrom's uh era project the erc project that i'm i'm uh, i'm working in um so this is the hypothesis of uh, uh one more risky more dangerous pathway um driven by positive feedbacks and the second hypothesis uh, hypothesis of a non-linear social transformation leading to a more stabilized earth state and um the um again uh, considering that we are currently at a crossroads probably uh, within the next couple of years between uh, these two trajectories and this is what all the discussion about climate policy etc currently is is about it's, it's one way to to view this and finally on this it's of course not only about climate change but there's also other sustainability dimensions that need to be considered this is what the planetary boundary graph on the upper left here shows there's importantly also the biosphere dimension biosphere integrity biodiversity to be considered but also other important um, life support systems of the planet um, that it provides for humans such as the land system freshwater biogenic geochemical cycles um, the integrity of the ocean and uh, ocean acidification as a, as a problem for this etc so it's, it's not only about climate it's eventually also about considering all these planetary boundaries and their interactions and to sum up this whole talk it is important um, and and still relevant to study the dynamics of climate tipping elements under global warming um, particularly because the, the risks are so high and and uh, the uncertainties are still relatively large so we need to reduce the uncertainties urgently um, the interactions of climate climate tipping elements and risks are um, even more understudied and, uh, and need more attention. And this is something that we are also working on, of course. And finally, the, um, the potential for positive social tipping points for global sustainability and, and their whole system interactions uh, need to be studied further. And that's the whole agenda of what, what we call whole earth system analysis, or some people call it also human earth system uh, modeling. And, and there's also many other words for that now. And with that, I. Thank you very much and for yeah for further information and uh, publication lists etc I, I would point you to these websites and also please drop me an email if you are interested in following up thanks a lot yeah <clears throat> thank you thank you very much uh, Jonathan I have a problem here with my Okay, no, no, I got it. Thank you very, very much for this uh, fascinating talk. Um, uh, and I, you know, I mean, this is so utterly complex. <laughs> I, I wish you all, you know, success in, in, in modeling this. Uh, it's fascinating. Um, now, uh, Jonathan is available for questions. And there's one question that I can answer right away for him. Uh, is the talk recorded? Yes, all our Game Changer talks are recorded. Uh, and they will be put on our website. And um, so by tomorrow morning or something like that, you will, uh, you can have uh, access to it and, and, you know, listen to it again, if you want. Now for the question and answer, we have two uh, ways of, of dealing with that. You may either, you know, use the raise your hand feature in Zoom and uh, raise your hand and then uh, Billy will give you the microphone or as uh, has, has already been done, uh, people can type their questions in the chat and I will read them to uh, Jonathan and to the others in the, in the audience. Uh, and I start with that. 
so the first question is by Alessandra Conversi, question related to the social tipping elements. What programs can be envisioned then can, that can advance such positive tipping from global to local scale? Yeah, so there's, um, there's of course, um, a, a strong focus on, on this, on this, um, on this in the, in the publications that I mentioned. And in our own work, um, we've, we've called this the social tipping interventions. Um, and, and we've, we've extracted this from, a, from the large scale expert elicitation that I mentioned, where, where uh, over, over 100 international experts uh, were participating and providing a lot of qualitative information on, on these tipping elements. And these social tipping interventions are, uh, can be, for example, policy, uh, really polic policy measures that are quite um, quite maybe not not politically easy to implement, but at least they are they are quite sharp decisions. For example, uh, removing fossil fuel uh, subsidies uh, has been identified as such a social tipping intervention uh, in the energy system tipping element, and this is something that is of course also um, also discussed in in different contexts uh, already. Um, that this needs to be done, but but this is still something that's it's still around. It's it's a bit like an elephant in the room and. Um, and, and this is this is one um, one um, one way. Uh, so basically, very very clear policy decisions. Another way is um, it's more yeah providing certain angles for social movements to uh, where where the potential to to trigger large scale change could be very could be it's quite promising. And this is for example uh, an example is the the cluster the tipping element cluster around so, um, social norms and um, and uh, values. And uh, there, the intervention that has, has been identified is really uh, revealing the moral implications of fossil fuel use. And this is um, actually the intervention, you could say that uh, Fridays for Future and Greta Thunberg particularly has been using. So she has been standing in the UN uh, assembly and said, be ashamed of yourself, you are destroying the future of your children. Uh, so this is another type of intervention. And uh, there, there's actually much more work going on on this. There's even a, uh, and then I, I stop at one more point. It's even in the UK, Cameron Hepburn from Oxford University, he has led uh, uh, an assessment group that has produced a report for the government that has uh, produced a list of many more such interventions that could really accelerate the decarbonization transformation. And, and such, so this is really uh, ongoing now on, on many different fronts that people are researching into this. And um, yeah, I, I'd like to, I can point out this report to you uh, if you write me an email. That's really interesting. For example. Okay, Eike Günther asks, uh, thanks for the interesting talk. I have one question. Did I see correctly that the melting of the permafrost is slower than the melting of the ice in Greenland? I always thought the release of methane from the permafrost is very critical. Yes, you are, um, this is a good point. I'm, I'm personally, I'm, I'm not a permafrost expert, so um, I, I don't want to, I cannot I cannot uh, give you too reliable information on this, but the um, what what I know is that there, there are still quite some considerable uncertainties uh, on the permafrost dynamics, and uh, there also disagreement between different experts and and uh, and fields uh, and communities on this. Um, I think one one way to view it maybe that the Greenland ice sheet is um, it's actually quite vulnerable, potentially already at relatively low levels of global warming, maybe even now, because, um, because there's accelerating, there's, there's a strong med elevation feedback in Greenland. So, um, and also there, there is, um, there is nonlinear dynamics in the ice flow that can really lead to strong acceleration of glaciers that we are actually already observing now with remote sensing and, and other ways. Um, while for the permafrost, um, some of it is, is quite, it's very, very deep in the ground and, and thus just due to um, thermal conducting, uh, conduction reasons, for example, it, it takes very long for global warming to penetrate to this depth. Also, some of it is in very cold, very remote regions of Siberia, for example, where it takes a long time uh, until global warming really um, impacts there. But then we have strong polar amplification and we've seen strong heat extremes in, in Siberia last year, for example, due to this uh, jet stream lock-in dynamics. So there might also be uh, much more 
danger for the permafrost, so to say, than people are have been thinking when this graph was made. So there's still, as I said, this research is still uh, very dynamic. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I read one more question and then I turn to uh, Hans Sinica, you know, who uh, raised his hand. But the, the question first uh, was, how can we counter the prevalent uh, popular belief that if AMOC switches off, that is good because it will cause a new ice age that will cancel or mitigate global warming? Yes. I mean, this is... Um... This is, of course, I mean, there's several ways that one is, is of course, that um, this will only be, this would only be in, in a completely unmitigated global warming, this would only be a temporary effect. And it has on a global level, a, a very small or even minuscule effect, because it's just a redistribution of heat. Um, and it would have some, uh, some cooling implications for, for parts of Europe, uh, for some time, at least, but I think one one there, there are several strong um, arguments which are which are related to to very negative impacts of this anyway. So one is that, um, for example, there's sea level rise um, uh, associated to to an AMOC tipping um, in, uh, for example, along the U.S. East Coast, uh, up to a meter of sea level rise because the AMOC uh, uh, when the AMOC slows down, this is because of the dynamic readjustment of the ocean surface to uh, to the circulation. It's basically uh, um, Coriolis force, etc., and uh, and this is this can lead to up to a meter of sea level rise in New York. Um, and uh, one important thing for me is always that the weather patterns would, would would could strongly change over Europe because a lot of our weather is generated uh, south of Greenland in the North Atlantic, where the deep uh, the low pressure and high pressure systems are generated and then are propagating towards the uh, towards the east. And then hit Europe, and uh, this the, the patterns of, of this could change strongly. And uh, this um, this because this is the very region where the AMOC, uh, the deep water formation of the AMOC is happening. And um, I think this is this is something that, that could have uh, still it would would change everything completely. Um, even even if the the mean temperature would 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 be stabilized for at least some time. And this this again shows that looking just at the mean global temperature is not really not uh, not so meaningful. It's the same with geoengineering proposals. Sometimes uh, when they just control um, uh, the, the global uh, mean temperature, there's still a large change in uh, temperature patterns, uh, but also in the, in the uh, moisture budget, for example, of the atmosphere. So it's, it's very difficult to control everything at the same time. And, and that's why, yeah, don't just look at, at the mean temperature of the Earth. Okay, let's let's uh, you know open the mic uh, for Hans Sinecker and then Michel Crucifix, uh, who both uh, have uh, raised their hand. So Hans, please go ahead. Hello, hello. Thank you very much for this uh, fascinating talk. I found the movie about the melting of the ice uh, in Antarctica particularly revealing, and um, so so many questions. So I, I guess I recommend that we all look at your talk again uh, or, or on, on the recording. But my question is more, more a political one. I wanted to know what's going on at the Potsdam Institute for Klima Folgenforschung. Since I lived in Potsdam for 15 years of my life, so I'm kind of interested what's going on there and how is your funding and, and is everything going well there or is there something to be left to be desired? Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's a big, big question, of course, but um, I, I think the, the, we, we, are, we are doing really well at, at the Potsdam Institute and uh, there could always be more funding, of course, for, for this type of um, interdisciplinary uh, earth system research that I'm, I'm for personally I'm doing on uh, social, uh, uh, ecological, social climatic perspective that's uh, still limited, but I, um, yeah, otherwise I think the Institute is thriving and um, yeah, we have had an evalu uh, evaluation just yesterday, and the results will be reported in a year. Ah. In a year, I can tell you more. <laughs> okay, uh, Michel Crucifix, please. <clears throat> hi, ca can you hear me? Yes. Yes, good. Uh, hi, Jonathan. It was a pleasure to hear you. Um, I have a question regarding infrastructures, I mean, material infrastructures, I mean, roads, hospitals, uh, warehouses. 
And all of that is organized in an energy system, with, in a system which is an organization which is very energy demanding. So when we think of uh, reducing our usage of fossil fuels, we have also to think about redesigning all this organization, but that takes time and it also takes energy. Uh, rede redesigning a road system uh, requires energy and materials. Uh, so what, what is your understanding of the constraints that it, that it puts on how fast we can decarbonize? This is a, this is a very good question. So this is my um, one, I think there, there is, there is quite this, of course, um, in, 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 the, in the scenarios and, and proposals that people are putting forward, there is some consideration of this, uh, like, okay, can we reuse infrastructure, for example, can we reuse um, natural gas pipelines for uh, hydrogen or for artificial fossil uh, fuels or artificial natural gas, um, basically generated from um, ambient CO2 or um, other, other sources? Which are climate neutral, um, and but but overall, I'm I'm also this is a question that is also very dear to me. Um, how to connect the world of um, economic uh, projections and uh, and these um, and also the the these uh, social technological net network dynamics models that I I've I've been showing uh, with the the more fundamental material and thermodynamic um, constraints. Um, that uh, because they have to have these constraints because ultimately they are physically embedded systems. And I think there's, there's still much to be done on, on that. And probably some of the pathways or likely some of the pathways that are currently considered um, are not consistent with su such constraints. And I think that that should be looked at much more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Um, at the end of the talk, you say that's Alessandra Conversi. You say that we will probably reach the crossroad within two years. Please expand. How do you get this number? And uh, are we are we done? A couple of years is close to zero. At the crossroads, yeah. Um, yes, I mean there's there's um, there's there's I think there, uh, okay, there's, there's several ways to look at this. One um, important one is to, um, if, we, if we look at just the, the global mean temperature and, and the projections of, of the IPCC, the current also CMIP6 uh, model intercomparison project, so the latest um, state of, of the uh, climate modeling synthesis, um, one can see that the emissions have to start uh, reducing and not growing anymore really within the next very few years to be able to still have a chance to to meet the 1.5 degree target which is but which is however very still it is quite unlikely and there is people saying that it cannot be achieved anymore at, uh, at all i think there has been a declaration by by some climate scientists very recently on this um, but others are, are saying it's still worthwhile to aim for that and it's physically possible. Definitely the question is whether it's economically and societally possible. Um, but there will be soon the point then um, when it's even physically not possible anymore because of the momentum in the system. And uh, um, then the crossroads is really, it's not so much about the global mean temperature because the global mean temperature can be, um, can, can then maybe, if it's not stabilized at two degrees, by 2100, maybe it can be stabilized by 2.3 degrees or 2.4 degrees. Um, and it might also decrease again at some point, um, but there, there might be if tipping points in the climate system are triggered on the way that are not easy to reverse. Um, for example, the Greenland ice sheet or um, the Amazon rainforest, um, that, that would be a crossroads because some part of the earth system at least would be put on a completely different trajectory. So maybe we're not, we're not about to, there's not a crossroads really to a, to a super uh, hothouse state that uh, some people have thought maybe uh, um, after this paper by Will Stefan et al, but it's more a crossroads for, for some really critical subsystems. Um, yeah, that's at least my, my current thinking on this, but there again, this is a really dynamic research field and it can still change. Okay, the next question is by Thierry dudok de Witt. Hello, Thierry. Um, and actually, here's two questions, so I, I put them together. Can the study of animal populations in a controlled environment 
be of any help here? Or are these conceptually too different from human populations? Uh, and then the other question that he had, if we reverse course and manage to seriously reverse global heating, do we expect again some bifurcations that would mirror the scenario you presented as maybe suggested by simple dynamical systems? Or would the long time scales uh, for rebuilding ice sheets completely alter the picture? Yeah, first question is, uh, yes, there, there is um, there is a lot of um, insights that can be drawn from, from so-called collective behavior and uh, crowd dynamics in animals um, on for human social dynamics. But of course, this is also limited because humans uh, are much more yeah, more complex, more reflective, more much more complex social structure. But there are there are these parallels, and particularly on a modeling, uh, a methodological, mathematical description level, there's a lot of parallels. And we are also working with such scientists, um, for example, Ian Cousin uh, in Constance at the Max Planck Institute for Collective Behavior. Um, now, there on the other question. So this is about hysteresis effect on the on the level of the whole Earth system, right? Uh, if I understand it correctly. So yes, I mean. It's um, this is quite quite likely, um, but but also not not comprehensively studied. Uh, so I, I'm not aware that such hysteresis experiments have been systematically done for um, for for large, complex, highly resolved um, Earth system models of the current um, current kind. But but there are groups working on this, and um, a lot. Important is, for example, the carbon cycle and other systems, which can have very long uh, memory effects and and uh, very um, so the distribution of of carbon in different uh, domains, for example, can be quite different when global warming is reversed compared to how it was before. And this is also the case for ocean biogeochemistry and other other systems, um, not just the ice. Mm -hmm. Manfred Schüssler, uh, with respect to social tipping. Agent-based models similar to your approach have been tried to model and predict the COVID-19 infection rates. Have this been successful and how does that bear on the re reliability of this kind of approach? Yes, yeah, so they have, um, they have, they have, they have, I think the interesting, there's an interesting parallel um, that in that they they have been quite successful in in, um, in 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 predicting certain developments, but um, there's always an uncertainty in in what the human behavior in the end will actually really be. So they have been really studying different scenarios. So scenarios where people are are more cautious uh, in, in 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 adhering to the rules or breaking or maybe they are they are more prone to break the rules at some point and then to say okay how would then the development of infection look like and there's for example this work of viola priseman uh, i think yeah from Göttingen who who has done quite a lot of this and and this is also in in terms of the methodology it's quite close to the types of social tipping models that we are doing so it's also network models um and um, also adaptive network models because the social networks can change when people avoid meeting others, the social network changes, right? It becomes more sparse and it gets a different structure. So um, yes, they are successful. It is in, in the sense that, that different scenarios can be explored that, that have actually um, occurred then in the real world, but it, it, it's impossible to really predict when a change in, in behavior will occur, when people will suddenly become more cautious or less cautious. And this is probably the same for the type of modeling that we are doing. So we can, we can study different scenarios of the development of such systems and we can identify uh, hopefully under which conditions um, social systems become more critical. So when do they become more susceptible to positive social tipping? But we cannot predict when this will happen or um, yeah, how exactly it will look like after the tipping happens. Eckhard Stürmer has a question that I would also have. Which assumption about the growth of human population has been included in the models? Hi, Ani. Hello. So the, the question. <laughs> Hello, Ani. Um, yeah, this, so in, in the emission scenarios um, that the IPCC um, is using and that are studied in these models, um, the population growth scenarios are also considered. So they are, um, they are um, via the integrated assessment models. The population projections are um, are put in, but um, um, 
they are not usually a dynamic uh, part of the model. So they are more a, a scenario that is, um, is, is, is used. So there's no feedback effect on the population uh, size, for example, which is of course another, it's an interesting question. And there's a kind of modeling um, like a, in the tradition, for example, of the limits to growth uh, reports, the world three, world four, now earth four model um, that are doing this, that are considering these population effects in a dynamic way. And I think that is more or less the last question uh, here by Jens Schrömberg. Can, should the bio-geo-anthroposphere circle be accompanied by a, with a third sphere, internet, cyber, virtual sphere on the right-hand side of the anthroposphere in, in one of your diagrams, I think it referred to, you know, yeah. complex systems. So would, would, would that matter as well? You're producing a lot of, using a lot of energy, the, the, uh, yeah. The, the internet. <laughs> oh, yes, it's it's a I think very relevant uh, very relevant point. There, um, this is sometimes called the technosphere now in in Earth system science, and um, I find I find this point very interesting. It's also open um, open research how to include this in in such model uh, link assessments, how to um, to study the. Um, the implications of, of increasing dynamics in, in the internet and digital sphere on global warming actually uh, and other sustainability dimensions. Just think of uh, cryptocurrencies which are using huge um, computational uh, demands, uh, a huge energy that is used for just computing Bitcoin and other uh, cryptocurrencies and uh, maybe AI. There's also people saying that artificial intelligence will also use increasingly large computational power and increasingly large energy so that this might become a very important driver even on the earth system level at some point, uh, or maybe relatively soon. And then one has to consider this, of course, in these types of analyses. Yeah, I think Thierry puts it all, you know, uh, very nicely together. Thank you, he's saying that was a very inspiring talk and I can only agree with that. Thank you very much, Jonathan, this was really great. Uh, and before we close, let me just um, say a few words about the next uh, talks. Next Thursday, there is a, a going to be a holiday in, in uh, Switzerland and in other parts of Europe as well. So we will not have a seminar next Thursday. But instead, next Wednesday at 6.15, there will be a pro ISI talk, uh, also virtual by um, our two postdocs. Uh, and it's very diverse. One is on exoplanets and the other on a, a cycle in, in the global uh, sea level change. So it's very interesting to have our talks uh, and I invite you to, to join that. Just consider, uh, consult our web page to find the link to that. And then the week thereafter, we will back at the Game Changers with Adam Rees, the Hubble constant controversy, an astrophysics talk. And with that, I'd like to close. Thank you all very much for attending this uh, seminar uh, and uh, have a good e evening or day wherever you are. Thank you very much.